Good morning, and welcome to the first plenary session. My name is Misha Kavanaugh, and I manage postdoctoral and academic programs at Sanford Burnham Prebys Medical Discovery Institute in La Jolla, California. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Rafael Luna, who's the Associate Dean at the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, as well as the Director of the Boston College Pre-Health Program. Dr. Luna received his PhD in molecular virology as an HHMI scholar from Louisiana State University. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, while he was a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard Medical School, he also served as the co-chair of the Postdoctoral Association from 2009 to 2011. Just recently, he stepped down as the executive director of the National Research Mentoring Network, or NRMN, a nationwide consortium of biomedical professionals and institutions collaborating to provide all trainees across the biomedical, behavioral, clinical, and social sciences with evidence-based mentorship and professional development programming. Within NRMN, he was the principal investigator of the administrative core, utilizing data analytics to strategically grow the organization and effectively reach all 50 states. In his current role as at Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, he advises more than 2,000 pre-health students and encourages them to be the authors of their own career stories. When I spoke with him over the phone prior to this annual meeting, what struck me most about Dr. Luna was his genuine enthusiasm and passion for mentoring. Having benefited from numerous mentors and using that experience to advocate and mentor others. I'm sure that you will see this in his presentation today, Transitioning from Bench to Institutional Leadership. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rafael Luna. <clears throat> Hello, can everyone hear me? Um, my slides are up. So uh, thank you for the invitation to come speak. The organizer of the NPA, I'm a big fan. Uh, I was there in Boston when uh, the NPA was there at Harvard Medical School, uh, the annual conference, and it was quite exciting. And so I was uh, just starting out as a postdoc, and I said, wow, what a great organization that would help advocate for me. And that started something in me where I can do something for others, and how can I make a difference for others? And so currently, I'm at Boston College, and we try to make a difference there and follow the mission of um, men and women for others at Boston College. So uh, today it could be quite interactive, so we have plenty of time. Uh, I don't want to keep you from lunch, but if there's any questions or comments, feel free to just raise your hand or and let's just have a conversation. So we don't, so I don't have to talk for a straight hour and we can just engage. And so Boston College uh, was founded uh, by the Society of Jesus in 1863. And, and then also in 1907, the campus moved to uh, Chestnut Hill. And our alumni has grown from 1964 to the present to over 180,000 alumni. And so that's a strong alumni across not only the United States, but across the world. And our motto is men and women for others. And how can we service not only our community, but our the extended community and make impact regionally, nationally, and globally. So the creed that we have is men and women for others. And we, when I mentor students and advise students at Boston College, we normally start off the conversation with uh, what are you doing for others? And I think uh, the NPA does that. The NPA is working hard for you. And it would be great if you're uh, you're already, I'm already preaching to the choir here, but to let your constituents know the value of them getting involved with the MPA and the local postdoctoral associations so that they can actually build this community and help more postdocs transition to the, uh, where they want to go and their career paths. So I'm, I'm the associate dean uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences at Boston College, and so I'm the junior class dean. So uh, everyone, uh, there's 2,000 students in the junior class, and when, my job is to make sure, when they come from the sophomore level, to make sure that they get to the senior. 
and then we'll hand them off to another dean. So there are four deans. And so there are four deans, a dean for the freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior. So even in this role in, in higher ed, it's shared governance. So when we have cases about students needing to withdraw or take a medical leave, and exceptions to policy in higher ed, we make decisions together. So a lot of this talk is thinking of how to really communicate and get buy-in from others and your peers and also with the rest of the institutions. And my other role at Boston College is the, the director of the pre-health program. And even in that role, uh, is shared governance with uh, Professor Tagan, and she is the chair of the faculty uh, committee uh, for pre-health. And so we work together, we make decisions that impact our students, over 2,000 students, 500 pre-med majors per class um, in the, at Boston College. And so what we do is we work from them from freshman all the way to senior and even alumni. We work with them to uh, make sure that they uh, pursue their, their careers. And we have our mission statement for the pre other program, which is provides advising and support to undergraduates and alumni uh, considering careers in the health profession. And so we don't only want to get students into medical school, we want to make sure that they find their best career fit. So a lot of times with mentoring, uh, you're helping others, but sometimes they'll choose a different path, and that's where you switch hats from mentoring to advising, and you kind of still help them go along. And so that's what we do uh, at Boston College. I'm quite excited about that. Um, but for the long-term uh, success in higher ed, we require the next generation of scientists to represent the population it serves in the United States. I was formerly with NRMN, so I have a deep passion for diversity, not only at my institution, not only within my state, but across the entire country. Um, and so along that, with that passion informed a, a grant that we submitted to Boston College, which was funded by the provost office, that we want to understand the STEM landscape in the United States. If we say we want to make a difference, what is that difference we want to make? And is there an increase in uh, STEM degree completions within the United States? So from, we looked at data from um, IPEDS, which is the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System from 2011, 2016. And there's an increase you can see from 2011 to 2016 of 30% increase in the, the sheer numbers of individuals getting STEM degrees. Now these STEM degrees are associate's degrees, bachelor's, uh, master's, and, and doctorates. So with the steady increase and and then now all of a sudden you're, you're postdocs and your constituents are postdocs with so many people entering the market. There's not faculty jobs for everyone. And so how, you know, what can we do to, to understand the landscape? But then also there's opportunity. With challenges come opportunity. So with this large scientific population being trained in the United States, there's opportunity for postdocs to be engaged and reinvent themselves in new positions to really impact and help usher and train and mentor and advise these students, uh, which are almost 800, over 800,000 students. So you're in a unique position. So it may not be necessarily faculty, but there's higher education and there are other roles in nonprofits um, and also in industry as well. So uh, STEM degree completions by gender breakout. Now these are all degree completions in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, from associate's level all the way to the doctorates. And so what's interesting is uh, that m women outnumber men almost two to one, uh, but with the degree completions. So that was quite interesting to see. We knew that there were more women getting trained in the, the, in the scientific workforce but we didn't know that that discrepancy was that large. And, and it remained so from 2011 to 2016, stayed consistent. But if we look at non-resident aliens, those without a green card and on visas, then it was actually the opposite. So the scientists that are coming in and getting their degrees in the United States from other countries are mainly, are there more men than women uh, coming to, and in receiving, um, they're serving as students that are non-resident aliens in the United States. And overall, from 2000, 
uh, 11 to 2016, we can see in orange, uh, this white, the Caucasian population has increased in 22%. Uh, but the non-white, uh, we'll see an increase from 2011, I mean, to 2016, a 44% increase. So the numbers are getting long, uh, bigger as well. And they're all entering the, the workforce. So where, where are these uh, students going? And so if we look at STEM doctorate degrees completion in the United States, we can see that the pie from 2011 to 2016 remains fairly consistent, where uh, the Caucasian population, the gray on the left-hand side, uh, it's about the same from 2011 to 2016, about 57 to 55 percent. Um, and the Asian population is from 13 percent to 14 percent. And so that remains uh, about the same. So even though the numbers are getting larger, uh, it's still, the percentage is still the same. And we, we look at African American in gray, it's still 5%. Even though the numbers of African Americans getting their degrees are increased, it's just that it's still the same slice of that pie. And so, but if we look at that pie from the non-white population, because diversity is important. Um, and so, if we look at that, uh, individuals that are considered non-white. And in this, uh, we can see non-resident alien, whether you're Caucasian or not, they're considered um, uh, non-white in this uh, pie. So there's 28, uh, there's 30, between 31 to 28%. That remained pretty much consistent. And then we see, uh, again, 11%. We see African Americans. It stays about the same. And Hispanic Latino between 11 and 12%. So. The pies hasn't changed between 2011 to 2016, but the numbers have. But if we look at gender, what we found was quite interesting for us was that if you remember that there were more women in getting STEM, degree, uh, STEM degrees in the United States, but at the doctorate level, men are somewhat catching up. And so it's really close in that regard. And so uh, that disparity is not as uh, prevalent. So we concluded that the U.S., as you know, is a highly trained workforce, and there's a steady increase in the number of degrees awarded in the U.S. STEM fields uh, from 2011 to 2016, and that the growing number of individuals from diverse backgrounds is increasing and being trained in the STEM workforce. But where is everyone going, and how can we be helpful? How can we be men and women for others? How can we serve this growing population, which is uh, numbering almost into the million of how do we help them make sure that they continue along their path? Because a, a highly educated uh, uh, workforce is a smart workforce and can hopefully impact our country and impact uh, um, the nation in a positive way. So I just want to talk a little bit about the work that I did with uh, NRMN. So the theme is shared governance. And so uh, anywhere where I've been successful, I've always worked with someone else. There's you know, my success has always been based off someone else and working with someone else, gleaning knowledge from others. And I was very fortunate to serve as the executive director of NRMN for a time and work with the wonderful mentors that are the leaders and the PIs of NRMN. So on the left, we have J.K. Jambor Vishwanatha at the UT, uh, at the University of Texas Health Science Center. Uh, we have Dr. Elizabeth Ophelia at Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Chris, uh, Christine Fund at University of Wisconsin, Keith Norris um, at UCLA in the Coordination Evaluation Center, and Dr. Kola uh, Okuyemi, who's at the University of Utah. And together we worked to really try to stretch and, and really bring what NRMN, what it is today, which is a real, true mentoring network across the entire United States. And so which is, it was so good to run into most of you today and to hear that you're involved with NRMN and you work with NRMN, you've done some of the mentor training, some of the grant writing sessions, you've hosted it, and we're very excited about that. Um, and so, but every time I had a new idea, you know, it's not that I did it alone, I consulted with my team, I worked with them, and, and I know all of you are highly intelligent individuals, but some of your ideas may not be the best ideas or maybe not be fully vetted, but that's okay. Um, and that's where you'll have healthy discussion and, and ponder it over time 
And then that's where you can really make the best decision making uh, in cohort and in agreement with others. So one of the decisions we made as a leadership team was that for me to go, uh, to go west. So I went out west from Boston. And so if you've heard of, familiar with the, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, they have these, uh, inst these called INBRI awards. They're Idea Networks of Biomedical Research Excellence. It's one award, award per, per state in about 23 states and Puerto Rico. And so every, every state that's highlighted blue or red, it's part of this, uh, they receive one award per state. And they're funded by NIGMS. And they have a biomedical research network. So my job was to team up with the leaders there and to work with them. And so everywhere it was colored red is where I went. And typically in the Mountain West, NRMN at the time when I joined, uh, we didn't have a lot of presence that we had. But afterwards, working with the shared leadership team and really effectively going in there uh, and working with uh, community colleges and the networks, we were able to build and rapidly grow NRMN to where it is today after four years and to where it's a national uh, presence in all 50 states and vibrant within all the states that are highlighted in red. And the ones that are highlighted, uh, highlighted in blue, we also have a presence there as well. And so I got to travel a lot and I went to the Southeastern Regional Inbury Conference in West Virginia. And so that's where they brought PIs from Puerto Rico, South Carolina, um, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, and we, and from Kentucky. And we worked with them and aligned NRMN with their vision and to improve diversity there and to help them with some of the mentor training and the grant writing coaching that can help their networking. Because they had the same goal of building their biomedical infrastructure within their state. And this is my second time to Cleveland, and Cleveland rocks, so. <laughs> and I was just so happy when I uh, got the invitation to come, to come back to Cleveland, and the NPA was here. Absolutely love Cleveland, and we, uh, NRMN teamed up with the Cleveland Clinic at the uh, Postdoctoral Association, uh, and we got to meet the great people at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, and the postdocs there, and really got to listen and engage and hear some of their concerns, what do they really uh, want out of their careers. Some of them want to go to faculty, some of them want to do administration, some want to go to industry, and the skill sets are quite different for each one, right? It's like almost like a stem cell, uh, if, but as, throughout your, uh, as a postdoc, you start becoming differentiated, maybe to a myocyte, to a kidney cell, or to something else. So, um, uh, so Really, the postdoc is such a great breeding ground to really to differentiate yourself and to really understand what your skills and your gifts are to really um, to go out and make a difference and serve others. So there is a, the, this little issue of the law of supply and demand. And so we saw the increase in STEM degrees in the United States. And so there's an increase in the supply of, of STEM, individual STEM degrees. But that's okay, so that those challenges present unique opportunities. So it's important to reinvent ourselves and that scientists can transcend and work in different sectors, whether it's business, um, policy. I uh, you know, met people here that do different policy and advocacy as well. So uh, there's legal perspectives. There's, there's so many different areas you can go into. And, and when you're advising your postdoc constituents at your institution, it's important to remind them of that. So when they say, when they're looking at the job market and it's looking a bit tenuous, part of it is just to open up that lens and to look at uh, what else is out there and also not only to look, open the lens to look outside, but also to enter for reflection, to see what they're good at and where it's the best fit for them. And so the nice thing about postdocs, it's just a unique place. So, when I was at Harvard Med, I was the co-chair of the postdoctoral association there with over 4,000 uh, members of all the Harvard Medical School affiliated hospitals. And it was a great time to really learn how to work on a committee, which didn't really, have, at that point as a scientist, I was always in the lab and working on my project. I collaborated with others, but the committee work was quite different. And those of you already working with NPA and volunteering and serving on those subcommittees and committees and leadership committees and executive committees, you already know it's, it's, it's hard work, 
but it's meaningful work. And it's meaningful, it's impactful because you can actually impact change um, at your local institution and abroad. But as a postdoc, it's quite important uh, for your uh, constituents that they do committee work and that they do go out um, and gain those skills, even if they want to become a faculty member because faculty, uh, they actually have a lot of committees and they'll serve on a lot of committees there as well. So there's no way to escape it. There's no way to escape it. So everyone's heard you publish or perish in academia, but in higher ed, it's shared governance or perish. So when individuals are interested in careers in higher education, and not just higher education, but also in industry and other places, um, I know we want to publish our high impact paper, but it's really how do you work in the sandbox with others? How do you work with others? Are you a team player? Are you encouraging? Are you uplifting? Are you moving the agenda forward? Is your agenda really the agenda of the institution and not your own agenda? So, um, so it's quite important to understand that, that it's shared governance and you're working in a matrix. And in research also we have tried to control the message of the research, but also of your program. And a lot of you here have your programs. And how do you align your programs with the mission of the university? It's quite important to make sure that you sustain funding. You know, one of the uh, heartbreaking things to see is that if a postdoc office that, that started and it doesn't have enough support, but part of that is to get, to get by and align your office with the mission of the university and to make it an integral part of that university to make sure that that office is sustainable over a long period of time and also is important fab fabric and, and tell that story of how the value of your postdoc office, what it means not only to the institution but um, to the community and also uh, uh, regionally, nationally. And, and so, and also whenever um, you're advising your constituents, we need evidence of service and committee work is quite key. Uh, one of the questions uh, that I was asked um, uh, during uh, one of my interviews was, you know, what's the evidence that you can handle difficult conversations? What's the evidence that you, if there's someone upset and you have a key stakeholder highly upset with you, and how are you going to resolve that conflict? And how do we know that you can handle this intense conflict? Because the stakes are high, these are leadership positions, and so how are you going to do that? So I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. You know, in your own life, what's the evidence that you can handle that? And if you don't have that answer quickly, then you may want to start thinking about ways that you can gain some of that experience. Because people want to see evidence. Uh, maybe the people that are hiring you or working with you or your key stakeholders or that are funding your office, they want to see evidence that if they bring you onto a committee that you will help the committee. Right, and so, so I, after a lot of thinking, I'll show a slide later. But you know, I've been the coaching Mission Hill Little League uh, since for over ten years, and the last four years I was the president of Mission Hill Little League. So when that question came up, uh, and then I said, "Well, I'm not sure about your key stakeholders, but the stakeholders I have in Mission Hill Little League, there's no one more upset than a mom or a dad of a little league." Uh, a little leaguer that's on the bench is not playing. And little Johnny is so talented and he needs to play. And that coach is not the best coach. And so that, you know, and I got the same response. They laughed, but then they, we went through examples of how we resolve conflict and to stay cool. So as scientists, we work so hard in the lab and we work and we work really hard. But conflict is not necessarily our biggest thing. We're good at conflict resolution in our research stories, but in conversations, we don't have enough practice. So volunteering in the community. I had no idea when I first started volunteering at Mission Hill Little League that I would gain that conflict resolution. But when you're the president of the Mission Hill Little League, and it's not that um, uh, there was no one else that with enough experience there, so they said, Raphael, you'll do it. And um, I had no idea that every single problem would come straight to the president. And people will call you, the parents will call you, the coaches, the coaches aren't fighting with, you know, fighting with the other coaches. We gotta get enough coaches, we need sponsorship. And so it's really like running a nonprofit. And it is a nonprofit. So um, I got a lot of tremendous skill that translate into the workforce. 
But that wasn't the reason why I did it. The reason why I did it was just trying to make a difference in the inner city community where I was this, one of those kids one day. Uh, I never played baseball, was kept from my team, but I thought that maybe I can help those kids start. That little Johnny that's, you know, that may not be able to hit that ball or make that pop fly, catch that pop fly, that maybe I can help that individual. And I've been able to see some of the, those individuals grow and mature, and it's been so, so rewarding. So, so get involved not only at your institution, but in service projects. And when I started volunteering with Mission Hill Little League, uh, I developed that relationship with Harvard Medical School. I was a postdoc there, and we really got more sponsorship from them, and we uh, really uh, connected and helped that organization as well. So mentoring, as, you know, as the former executive director of National Research Mentoring Network and being mentored by such a fantastic team of mentors, uh, within NRMN and the PIs there, but also uh, uh, NIH. I was mentored by uh, John Lorsch. Uh, we were former collaborators and, and also the program officers at NIH that really cared about diversity and inclusion and the biomedical research workforce. And so I was able to be mentored by countless number of uh, dedicated NIH officials and that worked hard to make sure that the, the funding of NIH is equitable across all 50 states and also to all populations. So, but the one thing about mentoring is, a lot of times is when you're mentoring someone, it's try to be more like me or how I did it. But it's quite challenging as well because times have changed. So we have to be on board with that and realize some of our mentees are experiencing quite different experiences. They're tweeting, uh, they're posting Instagram, uh, they're doing different things, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but how do we make sure we stay engaged where they still study for that organic chemistry test, that they still uh, work and strive and volunteer and, um, and still go through their career progression. It's quite important. So the mentor, what I've learned, was also is learning. So the mentor is not just sharing some knowledge, but we're also learning. So all of you that are mentoring, you know, stay abreast of uh, the latest research and mentoring, the science of mentoring, um, but also uh, different aspects of social media, which is important, which will help build your program. Uh, and we're doing that at Boston College, where our pre-health program, we're aligning it with the communications and outreach of the university. And so to really build the brand of Boston College and the pre-health program there. But at Boston College, we do something quite unique, which really drew me to where I am right now as an associate dean, and it's the advising part. Advise, it's a Jesuit college, and it really sets the tone for advising. And so it, they, they build a community which is quite unique and, and that I have seen. And at Boston College, we, the advisee helps the student find their unique career path. And sometimes they'll come into my office wanted to go to medical school or go to graduate school or do their PhD, but then they end up saying, you know what, my heart, when I ask them why, why do you want to do this? And if I hear things about their mom, their dad, it sounds just like little leaguers, you know, about their mom and their dad, but, but really what is it at that stage? And, and a lot of you that are training um, uh, uh, mentee, uh, advi have uh, advisees that are in college and and beyond, it's quite important to get them to see their own unique path. And so with men and women for others, uh, and the way we do that is uh, Father Himes, uh, he's a theologian at Boston College, and we ask these three questions. So in order, I wish I knew these three questions um, while I, during my, when I first started my presidency at Mission Hill Little League, it would have been quite helpful. And these three questions seem rather simple, but they really you know, fit the, what we're trying to do at Boston College, and, and, and that's why I'm here today to spread what we're doing, and hopefully you can use some of this in some of your programs as well, that we ask students, what are you good at? What brings you joy? And what does the world need you to be? And I can tell you countless number of times where this, these three questions help me deal with parents, because then I can say, well, little Johnny, he's really good at this. You know, this seems to bring uh, Johnny and Sarah really great joy, and they could really make a difference in the world. And then there's no parent that would uh, really not want that for their child. 
And sometimes that's even when someone wants to go into sociology and not to pursue a career in medicine, but to actually do social work. And that's quite notable and laudable, and we definitely encourage that. And so when you're dealing with your own constituents, uh, and your postdocs, they're highly trained. They're trained over many, many years. So you have four years as undergrad, sometimes five years, maybe if you're doing like a two to three program with maybe chemical engineering or double majoring. Uh, or if you do a post back and you do another year of biomedical research at NIH, like what I did. And then you have um, also, you, you know, if you do your master's, it's two years, and the PhD is anywhere between three, uh, four to seven years. And then a postdoc at a high research institution or at a, you know, at a primary undergraduate institution, there are postdocs there too. Um, so all these years start adding up. And uh, that's fantastic. So you're highly trained and you're very skilled, right? But then also you have this singular laser-like focus on research. This is what I hear at Harvard Med when I was a postdoc. You need that laser-like focus to get that science paper out, that cell paper out, uh, that nature paper. And you're rushed to be the first to discovery. You want to be the first one to solve the ribosome, or you're the first one to crystallize this protein or that membrane protein or that GPCR. Um, and sometimes you're not even sharing results with the other lab members. Uh, sometimes those results aren't even shared within your community. Uh, and also in science, it seems like in lab meetings, sometimes you're rewarded, the PI rewards you if you're a postdoc, if you're the smartest person in the room. However, some of those skills don't necessarily translate in the workforce, and we have to be quite careful. So whether you have specialized training over these 15 to 20 years, now we need to switch gears. We need to reinvent ourselves. We need to communicate and impact a broad audience. And some of you are doing that. When, if you publish your cell science nature paper, then you had to take your research and communicate to a broad audience. Uh, but then also, when you're doing committee work, you need, not everyone is going to have your specialty in molecular virology or in biochemistry or biophysics, so you need to be able to reach across the aisle and communicate. Um, sometimes I hope, you know, my hope is that uh, eventually Congress could do this as well, be able to reach across the aisle and, and to work together. You know, I'm trying to keep hope alive, so I'm trying to keep hope alive. So. Uh, and then also, we also consult our team members to get their buy-in. So in science and research, we're doing our experiments, and we don't normally ask, sometimes we don't even ask our PIs. We'll do it, sometimes our PI says not to do the experiment, and we'll do it anyways, and that's fine, that's great in the research world. But if you're working in higher ed, we have to be quite careful with that. We, you need to make sure we have you know, buy-in from our leaders, from my peers, from my, uh, my, uh, the chair of the faculty committee for pre-health. I ch run everything by her. And it's great, and I love it. There's nothing better than having an agreement. You know, we have two people that agree, or two or more that agree, it's fantastic. And it, you can impact long-lasting change. Uh, and the key is, in science, we're so used to being the expert. After 20 years of studying biochemistry, you seem to know everything about biochemistry. But then when you start working in higher ed or in your leadership position, you're doing advocacy on, you know, on Capitol Hill, now all of a sudden, you're not the expert anymore. And, but you still have to go present. You still have to go communicate. You know, before, you used to know 90% of the information and 10% unknown. Now, it's reversed. You know 10%, but you got to go out and present as if you know 90. And so I encourage you to take that risk and to take you know, to tackle that fear, to lean into that fear, to go out. If you get a talk, say yes. You know, they ask you to lead something, to do a new initiative. It, it may be hard, but you, you know, you do it hard and you go out and you do that because it's gonna be important for your program. If you stay stagnant, um, you're, you run the risk of having your program, um, uh, the sustainability of it runs, is at risk. And the time scale of execution. When I was in the lab, I got to run my own experiments, and I did that all the time, as fast as I want to do it. If I want to work till 3 o'clock in the morning, I do it. I'm sure some of you as well. You work till 3 in the morning, you work overnight. You know, you do those two-hour time points in molecular virology. Oh, 
those bugs that, you know, just keep tracking those cells every two hours to get those data points. And then somehow at four or five in the morning, the, the freezer goes out or the cell culture hood goes out. And then you have to do it again. And so, but you can, you can do that and you can monitor that. But in the higher ed is different. And also in industry is different. That you have to go to the pace and get that buy-in. And that time scale of execution is different. It's not only up to you anymore, it's up to others as well and getting their buy-in. And it's a process. But you really want you to, just like you enjoy perhaps working in the lab, doing your research, you should really enjoy the process. Uh, and I absolutely do love the process now. Um, so much so when I'm talking to my daughter, I'm like, what's the process about this that you want to go here and you want to do this? And she doesn't seem to like it very much. <laughs> so. Uh, and then when we're singular laser-like focus, uh, when your, your postdocs transition out into the workforce, how many of you were all busy? We multi, have to multitask and manage competing priorities. We, we have all these balls up in the air. We're not, we shouldn't let any of them drop. And, and it's, you know, we don't want to let the ball drop because we never know what ball that we drop will actually lead to us looking joining the job market again, entering the job market again, and looking for another job. And so it's quite important. But not only that, if you drop the ball, what about all those people that are counting on you and that, are, that need your guidance or your input on a document or something that could maybe help that grant get funded? That it's quite important to keep all those balls in the air um, and to manage the competing priorities. Uh, and so we do that, you know, you know, and my work at Harvard Med and administration over there, and also at NRMN and what I do now. You know, we follow the mantra, uh, the German mantra, if there are any Germans in the room. Uh, oh, okay, great, great. So we might get him to, to pronounce this, you probably say it better than I can. But it's eins nach dem anderen. And so that's like a German way of doing things, that one step after the other. And so I learned this from my German postdocs at Harvard Med that they were getting science paper, nature paper, and they would do one after the other. And I would ask them, how are you doing this? What's your rationale? What are you doing? Because here at, you know, when I, in grad school, I learned you do more with more. But uh, my postdoc uh, German colleagues would tell me, you know, you finish one thing, you do it really well, and you go to the next one. And so it's uh, excellence through every single step. And then you want to close the loop on all the administrative tasks. We don't, you know, if someone asks you to do something, we definitely have to close that loop. And uh, we, we, you know, in science, you're rewarded to reach that discovery. But you want to be the first, right? But you want to be the first person to help someone. So uh, when you want to be the first one to help your team. So if someone says, I would need some help here, raise your hand, be that first person to help. Because that brings value and that builds your character. And yes, we're all busy, but we can always add something else on as well. And, uh, and it kind of removes us and, it, and, uh, and inoculates us from doing our own, reverting back to our science of where we work in a lab by ourselves and doing it alone. And so it's quite important to volunteer to help others on your team, across campus, and even to other institutions as well. Because some of the institutions at Boston College, we share a lot what we do with you know, other Jesuit colleges, but other universities as well. We share it freely because we want to make sure that uh, we learn from others and also that others learn from us and that we can have a vibrant community. And there's always transparency in decision making. So where you're, someone may ask you, how'd you do that experiment? You may not want to show, uh, release that protocol until your paper's published. But here it's different. If you want anything published in higher ed, you need to let everyone see it first and then get them to buy in. And that's the best way to make that um, decision. And then also to share the initiatives with key stakeholders and to give credit where credit is due. Um, if you're, uh, gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy. Uh, it's really hard to have a long life uh, in higher ed or in the workforce. It's really about others and you're really praising others in public. And also, it's the right thing to do and it feels good. And so, uh, here's some more German. A Schlaumeier, no one likes a smarty pants. So, so when you're in that committee, you don't have to say everything on every single topic or be so passionate about everything. And I have to remind myself about this as, as well. Whenever the diversity topic comes in, you know, I just get so excited and I'm passionate about it. But I try to use, 
be strategic about when I say things and what I do. And also realize and remember there's a process because you uh, commenting on it may not be the right time. Maybe you can comment, pull one of the committee members aside and say it might, we might be able to address this a little bit better if we align our diversity mission with the mission of the, uh, the university or the mission of the college. And so, um, so it's quite important to do that. And I have really worked on this to be the, try to be the best listener in the room. And if you ask my colleagues, I've done that unsuccessfully. But I really do try to focus on being the best listener in the room. And so wherever I go, and I showed you that map wherever I traveled, I would talk to students and advisees, and I would ask them, what is that you need? What is that you want? What makes you unique? And when I went to the Inbury in Idaho, I tell them, what's so unique about you being a, a, a student here at Idaho? And what's so unique about you? And, but then I noticed that they all work so hard. I said, where do you get this work habit? And then they would all tell me they were like seven students uh, surrounding me, and they started explaining to me um, about bucking bales of hay. Uh, does anyone know what bucking bales of hay is? Yeah, so we have someone maybe from Idaho. <laughs> yeah. And I got to learn that some of these students during the summer will lift 40 or to 50 or 60 pounds of hay, uh, put it, pick it up, put it on their knees, lift it up, put it on the truck. The truck keeps moving. They go alongside the truck, and they'll do this for 8 or 10 hours all summer long. And I can't even do 20 minutes in the gym. So... <laughs> And then the, when these students get into the lab, and, we, and some of them are farmers, and the first generation going to college, and if you tell them, if you spend eight to 10 hours in the lab, what you can do, the amount of work, you know, it's skiing downhill for them. Because there's no heavy lifting. You might have to move an incubator, but you get help, right? <laughs> I had to do that in grad school. Um, I risked my life uh, moving incubators. So, but, you know, some of this work ethic is, is quite unique. So. Uh, so I got to listen to others and all across the country, and so it was quite, you know, a growing experience for me as well. And you really want to do your best to help others shine in the meetings, especially the person chairing the committee. You know, help them out because they, they have an agenda, they want to move that, through that agenda, and to be able to present that to others. And there's no such stronger work than committee work uh, to really move an organization, an institution, wherever you are. The best thing is to have a committee, and that actually moves the institution, and it gets stuff done. So the, um, your scientific career focus, you know, institutional leadership rewards those that, that help others and focus on the programs of others. I, I, we talked about the mission of the institution. It's quite key. And aligning your program, your postdoc office, with the mission of the university. So as we're winding down now, so what are some of the lessons learned? I talked about different aspects of shared governance and learning others. And what really attracts me to Boston College and what I do at Boston College, and perhaps at your university as well, uh, I got that at, at Louisiana State University, at Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, it was about community and service and outreach. At Harvard Medical School, impacting the, the, the community of Boston and also the world. And so, and at Boston College, I also learned as well, it's all about others. So, when I'm trying to think of what tasks to do and what new projects to do, when I start thinking, this will benefit me, I try to do less of those tasks and I really focus on what can I do others and what can I do to help others. Because that, you know, that's probably the area that you have the most amount of growth. And so if you're only sticking to what you do and what benefits you the most, may not be the best thing even for your career. And you want the perfect pace to ensure that you know, long-term success is through consistency, uh, typically working nine to five or nine to seven. Uh, and gray matters that it's rarely black or white. And even in the lab, even if you get a result and you're sure of that result, there's always this little bit of uh, data point that's an outlier or that doesn't make sense. And so it's always somewhere in the gray. And we need to be uh, comfortable operating in the gray when we leave the, the bench and we're in uh, institutional leadership. We actually need to be really com com uh, comfortable and confident of operating in that gray. So now I love gray. Uh, anything that's in the middle, I, I see that there's conflict resolution. So I hear one side of the committee, I hear the other side, and sometimes there are four or five different sides and four to five different directions, but I just love getting a little piece of everyone and just moving it together and, and having 
operating in the gray and to really work together and move and get buy-ins. It's, it's really beautiful. It's almost as beautiful as doing an experiment where you can see the results that you predicted and, and substantiate your hypothesis. Uh, and there's strength in numbers, and then there's excellence through diversity, which leads to innovation. I highly believe that. So, um, and part of that is that uh, when I was an undergrad, I'm the first gen uh, person in my family to go to college. Uh, my parents are immigrants from the Dominican Republic in El Salvador. And no one's ever, my dad went to the second grade, so he finished when he was eight years old. My mom finished when she was in the junior high, the ninth grade in, in their respective countries. And so I didn't have a mentor, but it was at a historically black college that they took me in and they mentored me. And they showed me how to study, what to study. Studying chemistry is quite different than studying you know, English where you read a novel. You know, chemistry is different, you work out problems. And along that, I, I did a, a lot of storytelling and I learned to adapt storytelling to science. And, and so it was just people mentoring me that allowed me to flourish with this uh, storytelling, which uh, if some of you know that I also teach that and go across the United States and across Europe, teaching scientific storytelling, helping individuals get their research into high impact papers. And here is what I normally call the Hall of Fame. All these individuals have used this method of scientific storytelling and you see this diversity. I never intended on having diversity of the people that I impact or reach or, or work with. I try to look at helping others as colorblind as possible, but in that, then we see all different people, races and colors and backgrounds, and there's someone in, uh, uh, that's had the PhD in economics, others in biochemistry, biophysics, from Denmark, we have Israeli scientists, Austrian, uh, we have African Americans, physicists, and so it was quite helpful and quite unique to see that. And that was brought about by uh, an inner city kid looking at science quite differently. And, and that's how I was able to, to impact others. And some of these people in the Hall of Fame, they were able to get their faculty positions. Uh, and that's based off of having this excellence and diversity. And so recommended actions when you go back to your postdocs, I know you're gonna go back all fired up, get them all engaged and say that we have to work better in the community and align ourselves better with the mission of the NPA, you know, tell them to lean into that fear of the unknown. Because a postdoc would tell you, well, I can't do it. I'm afraid if I don't get this paper out, um, I may not get this job. And you could tell them, well, if you're not on this committee, you may not get that job, right? Because even when you're on those faculty searches, they're committees. And so if you don't even know how your application is gonna be submitted to the faculty and how they're gonna be reviewed on the committee, it's hard to uneven prepare your, your, your application for faculty uh, positions. Uh, so really to tell your postdocs to lean into that fear of the unknown and consider committee work as an experiment. I was horrible when I first started. I was the Schlaumeyer on the committee saying this and saying that and, and then after two hours we didn't get anywhere and then one of the, uh, the, the chair at the time, well, it wasn't the chair of the committee, pulled me to the side and said, Raphael, can you try to be helpful? And <laughs> I was like, I thought I was. So remember, talking is not always helpful. And, and then she kind of coached me, and I had a mentor. And then uh, Jim Gould as well, the, some of you may know him, uh, uh, he actually mentored me and, as well and taught me about all the committee work and how to do that. And, and I got better at it, and, I just, and he's one of the best listeners that I know. So you really do want to get involved with the institution's postdoctoral association and get others on board and really commit to serving the mission of the MPA. I was so happy when the MPA had their annual conference at Boston College, uh, I mean at, Boston, at Harvard Medical School about 10 years ago. It really impacted me when I was an early postdoc to know that there was an organization out there for me. And so your work does matter. So you going out there, you coming here, bring it back to your constituents. Tell them that it's important, critically important for whatever direction they want to go, whatever, however their stem cell will be differentiated into, that it's important for them to get involved and to, to do committee work and to serve others because that's what's going to impact them and help their careers. Um, and so I mentioned uh, Dr. Gould, the director of the, uh, the postdoc office, uh, postdoc, office for postdoctoral fellows at Harvard Medical School. This is where I got all my training grounds and I was the co-chair there uh, and it just, it was just feels like only like three to four years ago, I was a postdoc and uh, to see this progression, it was through his mentoring, his advising, and him just being a friend. Um, 
And it wasn't just a friend to me. Some of you have your postdoc office. I can have your picture here as well. Um, and I know how many times if, you know, you'll listen to people. Some people, you know, Jim has a box of cleaners in his office. Some, some of the postdocs will come in tears. And so the work that you're doing matters. You're impacting people's lives. Some of these postdocs and postdocs have children, have families. And so you serve at a really critical period of their life. You know, just like physicians, you know, they see patients, you're doing a critical period of their lives. Um, postdoc officers and officers see postdocs at the most vulnerable position in their life, just about to differentiate into where they're, into the unknown, because there isn't a set path. There's no more graduate program. There's no more other program. You actually have to enter that workforce. So Jim has been a great buddy over many years. And I'd like to thank uh, the Boston College uh, uh, Provost Office for the, the grant that we received called Research Across Departments, RADS, is from the um, Office of the Provost that funded a lot of the work that we did with iPads. We were quite excited to publish and to, to see some of these trends that we're seeing in the US uh, STEM workforce. Um, and our collabor my collaborators on that work was with the, the Lynch School of Education at Boston College and the two master's students that are graduating, Jane Heaney and June Clawton. So if you, know, if you need any, uh, uh, they're graduating with their master's and they're on the job market. So if anyone needs uh, someone uh, that are experts at data and looking at data and, and want to impact your postdoc office, let me know and I can connect you with them. And they're willing to travel anywhere throughout the United States, they told me. So, and Professor Laura Dwyer, uh, it was a great collaboration working with her, learning about the educational uh, space. And I'd also like to thank the conference organizers and Christy for um, uh, managing and working with me to, to and have me invited. And uh, Dr. Cavanaugh, who introduced me, did a great job. And it was just so much fun to, to meet with them, to talk with them on the, you know, have these conference calls and talk about what we're going to talk about today and, and to share. And, it's, and not only that, she said that she heard my passion. The only reason I got fired up is to hear their commitment to the NPA and that, you know, uh, rest assured that uh, you have individuals working really hard to keep this thing going. And every year I see the room seems to get bigger and bigger, so it's quite exciting. And my buddy Jim, um, so I, I'm quite uh, happy to, that he worked at, they recruited him to come to Harvard Med and to become the postdoc uh, officer there. And here's my Mission Hill Little League. <laughs> Uh, here's the, they were the 2015 citywide championship, and I may not have been, you know, I didn't play baseball. I, that was full disclosure. I cut, and so I was working with uh, rookies from like four-year-olds. Then I, I graduated to the minors, the six to nine-year-olds. Then they had me coaching 11 to 12-year-olds, and I can't tell you how many times those 12-year-olds, they would throw a ball, and, or you know, they were as strong as A-Rod, and that ball would hit me in the face. I'm like... Guys, I'm wearing glasses, you know, take it easy on me. And, uh, but I coached this citywide team. Uh, I would like to take credit for this championship, but I coached the team in 2014, not 2015. <laughs> and we lost every game. <laughs> and then so they say they brought in the other coach, Jose on the left, uh, he won a parent, and they won every game except for one. <laughs> so the problem was me. And that's that year that I switched to becoming president. And, and then I was just happy for others. I was happy for them. I didn't need to be the actual coach that I could just do the administration, do what I did best. I reflected what I was good at. What brought me joy was seeing these kids do well. Um, and these are inner city kids, and they're growing, and we try to teach them character and other things besides baseball. Uh, baseball is such a great sport. I think opening days today here for Cleveland, so hope, you know, win. Uh, Red Sox won yesterday, so I'm quite happy about that. So I just want to thank you for your time. Uh, if you ever need to get in contact with me, uh, to partner with me, or to do anything, or to share any resources, we're more than happy. We're highly collaborative at Boston College, and uh, we would like to make sure that uh, we help this higher education community. So I'll take any questions if you have any. Uh, so there's only one microphone and one of me and lots of you, so I'm going to ask that if you have any questions to come to the middle here uh, and feel free to ask questions. I will start. 
Oh, sure. So thank you for the presentation. Um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about your own um, entry into this. So what made you decide to make this transition away from the bench and institutional uh, leadership? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I just noticed that, you know, at, uh, I, 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 at undergrad, I did horribly the first year until I learned how to put my, re, uh, my science, I put the Krebs cycle into a story, and I ended up going from uh, almost flunking out of college to graduating with the highest GPA in my major at, at Southern University, historically black college. Then went to, to NIH, published three papers in a matter of a year. Science was easy, got to LSU, you know, scored the highest grades in all the tests, everything was easy. And then I got to Harvard Med. And I prided, I prided myself on working hard and outworking others. And that was part of my key to my success was just outworking others. But then there was just this other person in the lab. Sometimes it's an American, someone from, sometimes it's from a different country, from Germany or from uh, uh, India or China, and I could not outwork them. And I couldn't, uh, and, and they had their gifts, right? And, and so I really had to think back and so when we talked about the mission of Boston College, what is, what is the, the question that we ask all our students is, what are you good at? And I had to think, okay, I'm not gonna be better than the, uh, my German colleagues um, at NMR spectroscopy. They already know quantum mechanics, uh, operators, and physics. I'm, it's, it's too late for me, I'm not gonna get that. Uh, I'm not gonna be better than my colleague, uh, Ting Fan, in biology. He loves cells, he loves cell culture lab. But then I just reverted back to what I was good at, which was telling stories. And that's what you know, started my whole journey with storytelling. Um, and my dad and I watched countless number of movies, and that's what I have fond memories of, stories and narratives and, and all these higher level graduate English courses I've taken. So I reverted to that, and I started doing scientific storytelling, wrote my book, traveled all over the US. And, and I think that started something different, and I realized that Maybe there's not a marketplace for me that fit maybe for higher ed. So I was so thankful that all the applications, the 50 applications I sent to faculty positions, that no one accepted me. <laughs> that was the best thing could have happened to me because it wasn't a good fit. And they clearly saw that. That wasn't my passion. Um, and the ones that did get faculty jobs, you know, my, my friend, Harry Bobby Arthanari, who's, who's a fellow postdoc with me now, he's a professor at Harvard Med, he loved those NMR spectrometers. He would be by the magnet, hugging the magnet, loving the magnet. And I was like, that's not me, right? But I love reading classic literature. I love communicating with people. I love meeting people. I love meeting students. I love meeting others and asking them about their stories and career journeys. So that made that transition for me. And then as I kept working and doing things for others, uh, more opportunities says, hey, Jim Gould was like, why don't you apply for this position? Um, at Harvard Med and, and the Office of Faculty Affairs. I said, sure, why not? And they love storytelling. They love the fact that I work in Mission Hill Little League. Then Jim says, again, Raphael, why don't you apply for NRMN? That looks like it would be a good fit for you. You've always talked about diversity and you're really passionate about it. And then again, uh, and the hiring committee saw that my passion was storytelling, so that kind of blossomed. And then Boston College saw all the work that I was doing at NRMN. They were like, well, can you do that for us and really build our impact as men and women for others across the United States and the globe. And that's how my career kind of took off. But finding my unique place and being honest with myself that I didn't love those spectrometers as much as some of my colleagues. I didn't love this, some of the cell work. And so I just love the stories and I love the people. So that was a great question. Hello. Oh, thanks so much for your talk. And I just want to tell everybody to look him up, Dr. Luna, on YouTube. He, I was so excited to see that he was speaking here because I show a video that he, a couple of videos that he does on um, giving an elevator speech. And it's awesome for anybody you're teaching from community college students to postdocs. And it also involves the storytelling. So thanks for that. My question is, um, how, do you, how do you suggest um, encouraging, and you did some of this today, but encouraging our postdocs that um, these soft skills are important and um, that they, they can be, I mean, as I say, you did some of this, but, but there is such resistance to spending time on you know, developing 
your, their, their skills that are not at the bench or that kind of thing. Um, and also, how uh, what I struggle with is helping postdocs to, to see what other options are out there besides the faculty track. Um, and I've been trying to find ways to help people, as you say, widen their lens. So I just wondered if you could talk a little more about that. Yeah, you know, what I you know, try to find out is that, um, you know, so similar to what I do with the pre-health, so we, we have um, 2,000 students, and so we write letters for the students graduating, so about two or 300 letters every year. And when I joined, and I said, okay, this is great. We have letters, we have a committee, and we send the letters out, but this is not good enough. What we need to do is have each letter be unique. What's their actual fingerprint? What makes them unique? that separate, like if there's 20,000 students applying to medical school, what separates their personal statement, their application from everyone else? Um, and that it requires a little more digging, a little more introspection, but everyone is different. Everyone here in this room is different. You might have postdoc offices, but you have them all different. And so what I um, uh, encourage uh, my advisees to do is to look deep. What is it that makes them unique and individual and what are they passionate about and that's the story that they need to tell. And so everyone's quite unique and, and I love stories. There may be some of you also have shared me your passion for storytelling and then we can operate in the same space. But then there are others that love NMR or biochemistry or policy and then they're in those spaces or mentoring or advising and to really play to their strengths. But they have to absolutely get that committee work um, and it's just essential for any job that they apply that it's not, you know, they may call it soft skills, but it's absolutely essential to being a human being. Um, because at the end of the day, they want to hire someone with high character and being nice to others and work in the community. So whether that's on a faculty. So at Harvard Med, I always got, won't you focus on your paper and stop all the storytelling? Um, I've heard that from deans at Harvard Med. Um, or they'll say, stop all the volunteering that you need to be in the lab. Um, because my colleagues, remember, they're, they're hugging the instrument and, and they love those instruments. But I love working with the kids. So I stuck to what I loved. And, and maybe it worked out for me, but, and it could not have, but at least it, I was happy at the time. And I still am happy. So uh, I think we have to move that fear of the unknown, like what's going to happen to me. Um, you know, we don't know how much time we have. We just got to operate and function in our best self. And, and our unique self, uh, and celebrate that, and celebrate the uniqueness of others. And that's why I really love diversity, because everyone is so unique and different, not just by race, but also by what they bring and their upbringing and their cultural backgrounds as well. That's a great question. Hello, my name is Elena, and I would like to follow up with the previous question, because um, I will talk on behalf of postdoc. A community and um, my question is um, most of us uh, we realize how it's important to develop our soft skills and we try to participate and develop oral reading communication skills uh, as a part of these committees but sometimes uh, there is some resistance from the principal investigators because they believe that we should work at the bench produce uh, the data and some of my friends, they didn't get approval for participation in these committees. That's why my question is, is there any program um, or way to reach out for the principal investigators and to explain them that we have always increased number of the PhDs, but the number of faculty position is not being really an increase. That's why not all of us are going to become PIs. And we really need to take part of these committees to develop these um, transferable skills. So I believe that we should work both with the postdocs, but also someone should explain to our supervisors how it's important for us to be part of these committees. So can you please comment on this? Yeah, and I can, that's a question that's like one of those age old questions with all the postdocs. You're dealing with faculty. Right, um, and that, that's a very difficult question to answer, but what I do know is that there was, um, well my, my daughter loves dancing, so there's nothing I can ever do to stop her from dancing. So whether she wants to do dancing, whenever I know, 
I know what I can say no to my daughter on. Uh, if she only asks me once or twice, I can say no, we're not going to the movies, we're not doing this. But if she keeps asking me over and over again, I think that then I start listening. And so, you know, the onus, I think, is on the postdocs. And I, and I say this with caution and with compassion and empathy. Um, I heard it from my own, uh, you know, they, my postdoc advisor, he saw that I was going all over and doing all these things. But then he saw value in the work that I did. So I think part of it is how to take the work that you do on the committee and bring that back to the lab. What is it that you can do to bring back to the lab? Maybe set up even committees, when the, if it's a large lab, set up committees in the lab and, and show that value of what, the work that you're doing and what it can impact. You know, access, so one of the ways that we do at Harvard Medical School is to show that working with the, the postdoc association, we're able to get funding for some of the you know, like a travel award. All of a sudden, now you're talking the language of the PI, so you're meeting them somewhat halfway. And so there are different ways to do it, but it, it's unique in every situation, in every case. But I think at the end of the day, like what I tell my students, that they're in the driver's seats at Boston College and that they could go out and reach out to me. Because, the, you know, now that I see it from the other perspective, from an administrator, you know, I manage like 4,000 students. And so I can't reach out to every single one of them. But if you're a PI with 30 individuals, they're managing so many and writing grants, and they still have their family and their children and their own uh, personal time. And so it's hard for them to be able to, to, to spend all that time on each of the postdoc. But then it's on the postdoc to really keep asking the, po uh, the PI, and in a way that's compassionate, but also show value. The biggest thing, I think, is to show value. So if you're if there's work with the postdoc office, then I would say, okay, how can we help our postdocs in the lab get funding for this? Maybe it'll be a grant writing course and that maybe there'll be more NRSAs in, in, the, uh, in the lab. Now, all of a sudden, you have more buy-in from your PI. And so there's different things, and every PI is a little different. Maybe, it, like if you're a Howard Hughes medical investigator, maybe money won't be so much of the issue, but maybe it's really connecting and bringing in collaborators from other uh, opportunities. So. But I think also PIs do realize the strengths and weaknesses, or not necessarily weaknesses, but the uniqueness of the, each and the individual postdoc. My, my postdoc advisor knew that I didn't love uh, the magnets. And so he was like, why don't you go do more? And, and he was the first person that said, Raphael, you should go become a dean. And I was like, well, how do you do that? He's like, I don't know, but you should go do that. <laughs> I was like, thanks a lot. But you know, he put that bug in my ear. So, uh, and then he sent me an email when I started my position. He said, I hope you remember, Raphael. I was the first person to tell you. <laughs> so yeah, I do remember. I do remember. He told me that four years ago. Um, and, but it's, it's, it's tough because postdocs, you're in a critical period and you're really almost fighting for your academic life and your career and what you want and all those years of training. We talked about the years of training. And so you have, when you have so much invested of time and sacrifice, that it's hard to just give things up. And so, but that PI as well, that's their lab and they're, they're going for tenure, it's hard for them to give that up as well. So trying to find in ways that can help them reach their goal and to help the postdoc reach their goal as well. So I'm always trying to find, operate in that gray. So that's, we could talk more, but it's really operating in that gray area. Okay, we have a question. Thanks so much. Hi, Katie Flint M from Stony Brook University. Thank you so much for that just really inspiring talk. I just, oh, thank you. You, what you said about being the most active listener in the room is actually something I've, I've written down twice now and I'm gonna try to remember that because I think that's really powerful. Um, my question is, is about something you said, uh, you said a couple times in your talk actually, this interesting dichotomy between uh, mentoring and advising. And you know, I will admit in, in my work, um, Normally when I use those two terms, particularly when I'm talking about postdoc supervisors, I tend to call them supervisors because really they're line supervisors. We want them to be mentors, um, and yet we know from the, like, the mentoring literature there's a little bit of an implicit conflict of interest there in being, being a mentor and your you know, employment supervisor. So that being said, we all have different terms for it, your PI, your advisor, your mentor. Um, sometimes I use advisor as a very sort of strong contrast to mentor, but the way you spoke about it, it's in one place it made it sound like sometimes you just need a different mode. Sometimes you're being the mentor, sometimes you're, you're advising, but then the definitions that you gave made them sound like advising was, was maybe lacking a little bit and maybe less advisee focused. 
And, and anyway, so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you view that particular dichotomy. Yeah, and, and a lot of this is through what I learned at Boston College. Um, and so a lot of mentoring is quite important. And you need, in order to really mentor, a lot of times you, if you're a biomedical scientist, in order to get your PhD, you need to have a faculty member. So to become a PhD, you have to be mentored by uh, your doctoral advisor. But at Boston College, we use the word advising as something separate. Because at Boston College, we really focus on the individual finding a unique career path. So when they come into my office at pre-health, um, it doesn't matter if they decide to go somewhere else. Uh, to go into theology or history or go into something completely different. My job is to help them find a unique career path and hopefully they'll stay at Boston College for eight semesters so that then they can go out and launch into the world. And so the, the way I, that I view it and the way we operate at Boston College is that mentoring is important. Yes, we still have PhD committees there and we mentor students, and, but the advising is really helping them reflect on those three questions, what they're good at, uh, you know, what brings them joy, and what does the world need them to be? And that, and that protects me from imparting my own vision of what them. I would love everyone to be a biomedical scientist and to study molecular virology. But if everyone studied molecular virology, that would be the worst thing for the world. So not that molecular virology is bad, but we need biochemists, we need cell biologists, we need animal uh, scientists, we need veterinarians, we need a whole diversity of workforce. And so that is the way we look at it at Boston College, and we apply the, the Jesuit philosophy advising and really helping them find a unique career path, which was quite different. And I think that's what drew me to this position I have now, was that I got to have an opportunity where they could be like me if they wanted to. They could even be more successful than I ever was. Maybe they would really love those magnets and, and biochemistry experiments more than I did, and that would be fantastic. Or they go off to medical school or they do something that's completely different. There's nothing like what I've ever done before. And that opportunity is such a growth opportunity for me, and I really enjoy that. And remember, like I worked with Mission Hill Little Leagues, I get so much satisfaction seeing others uh, doing and operating in the space that they're happy with, whether it be in a pitcher, a first baseman, in the outfield, you know, or they're great at bunting. We'll find out what they're good at, and we kind of make sure that they, they operate in that space. And so it's not that one word is the other, but I, if you look at mentoring definitions, there'll be a, 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 an assortment. You look at advisors, there's some, and they're kind of mixed. But at Boston College, we separate advising, that they can go on the unique career path. Mentoring is be more like me, which is fine. If, if your postdocs and your, your, your mentees are more like you, that's wonderful, because you're wonderful human beings. But not everyone can be like you. So, and um, because, you know, our world needs a diversity of training. But that's a good question, yes, thank you. Uh, hi, thanks. First of all, thanks so much for such an inspirational talk. Uh, my name is Shibi. I'm a postdoctoral fellow from Research Institute at Nationwide Children's. My questions wa question was mainly on the topic of the evidence of service, uh, as you mentioned, which is probably required or is uh, uh, favorable for the higher positions. Now, as a postdoc, you do get a chance to actually resolve a lot of conflict situations. They could be either between the colleagues or the team members or even other core facilities for that matter, but they are not always documented. Uh, like I don't have a record of like uh, how many conflicts that I was able to resolve or I was uh, yeah, a part of. And not every postdoc again gets to be on a committee where you can actually have some of it, some of these records. So in that case, how would you actually present it to the, uh, your future employee or so? So I've got you. two ways to answer that question. First is talk to the NPA. I'm sure there are plenty of committees and subcommittees <laughs> that they will be more than helpful to you to, to get you signed on. So that's not a problem. But then also, not only with the NPA in your postdoc office, but um, like I did Mission Hill Literally, my uh, first author collaborator uh, was from South India, from Madras, and he was on a committee and ran a nonprofit that had uh, South Indian music and brought people from India over and they had a committee and there was a lot of evidence of him working on a committee. And so we would share our best practices on how he runs his organization uh, and how I operated with baseball and dealt with conflict resolution. And 
And we really do need to have that. And so I think volunteering and service, definitely with the NPA. So if you're, uh, you're here, um, I'm sure you're on some committees, but please tell your fellow postdocs if they want that service and evidence. I got mine through working with, on, uh, being a co-chair on the Harvard Medical School Postdoc Association. And remember we had, it was a, a committee of like 14 different uh, representatives from all the Harvard Medical School affiliates. And so that was over 4,000 postdocs. Now they're up to 6,000 postdocs. So you get, it's almost like running uh, a little company or, or, and these skills will also translate to lab if you want to become a faculty member. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's ways to get involved. But if you're having trouble still finding, uh, please talk to the NPA officials and, and we'll get you on the subcommittee and, uh, and get you working and reviewing documents and being an active listener, being helpful on the committee and uh, encouraging the, and working with the chair. Yeah, I would just actually want to make one small comment that thanks to the Research Institute at Nationwide Children's, I have been able to be a part of the Research Institute Training Association for postdocs and the Research Institute Diversity Enrichment. So we're trying to do some of that uh, at Nationwide Children's, but of course at a global level it would be more beneficial. You're, so you're thank doing you. great, you're doing great. Okay, I'm gonna have to stop the Q&A for right now, but um, Dr. Luna will be around for a while, so please feel free to approach him and ask him more questions. I'm gonna pass the mic over to... Well, thank you for your time. Thank you.